All right, hello everyone. I'm Krzysztof Kotowicz, and yes, I will talk about JavaScript crypto. Who am I? Uh, well, I'm a web security researcher. I used to do a lot of research uh, on HTML5 security features, then moved to researching browser extensions, and now I'm into crypto. Um, I used to work with, uh, at Cure53 with Mario Heydrich, and this presentation is mostly based on the research that we, that, uh, we and I uh, have done over that time. Now I work at Google, but obviously for legal reasons I'm not endorsing, like Google does not endorse anything that I'm uh, going to present over this talk. So, let's see a show of hands. Who of you think that JavaScript crypto is a good idea? I, I don't see that many hands. Who of you think that it is a bad idea? Yeah, like half of you, I would say. So, um, if you Google stuff on the internet looking for JavaScript crypto, you will immediately see those two blog posts, mostly. Uh, the first one is by Thomas Ptaczek from Matazano, uh, entitled JavaScript Cryptography Considered Harmful. And the second one uh, by Nate Lawson, called um, Final Post on JavaScript Crypto. And these two guys um, are really strongly against JavaScript Crypto. And they give several arguments. These blog posts are sort of like a classical uh, view on JavaScript Crypto. Uh, so why is, is it a bad idea, according to them? So first one, uh, client-side cryptography is not needed, like in the browser. So, if you are trying to encrypt something on a client side in order, for example, to, to server not to have access to the plain text, it unfortunately won't work because the server serves you the JavaScript files, so it can backdoor the JavaScript files. So, in any sort of uh, cryptographic applications, you need to have the implicit trust on the server, right? Uh, and also, you need to implement or uh, serve the application over HTTPS because then again, uh, if that's not happening, if it, if the data comes uh, from plain text connections, then it's of course um, prone to many of the middle attacks and, and tampering with the data by uh, some sort of uh, uh, network observer. So it's not needed because you already have a secure channel to the server and you need to trust the server, so why not uh, relaying all the cryptographic operations to the server code, where you somehow control it. Um, but it's not only that, it's also dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous because there's this thing called cross-site scripting, so pretty much a uh, very popular flow in web applications. Uh, and for crypto code, obviously, um, executing attacker's code in the same sort of uh, namespace, let's say, uh, is like destructive immediately. Like attacker can, for example, extract keys, plain text, um, and and whatnot. Like basically circumvent any sort of uh, cryptographic uh, operations. And also, it's hard because JavaScript is not the most uh, convenient language to implement the crypto with. Um, also, the libraries that were uh, present at the time were of mediocre uh, quality. So, the gist of uh, the view on JavaScript crypto is that it's necessarily doomed to fail. And obviously, like any things that are doomed to fail, uh, become a huge success on the net or become widely adopted. So, right now in 2014, we have libraries implementing multiple like cryptographic primitives in JavaScript uh, symmetric crypto, asymmetric crypto, uh, there's TLS implementations, there's a few open PGP uh, protocol implementations a lot of uh, user applications built um, upon those libraries and some random crypto protocols as well. Uh, those three applications, uh, you probably know at least uh, some of them. There's CryptoCat, a multi-part um, encrypted chat application, Mailvelope, which is uh, basically GPG or PGP in the browser, and OpenPGPJS, which is library used by, for example, Mailvelope. So uh, those three applications I have mm, uh, looked at as well, and some of uh, my findings will be featured during, featured during this talk. 
uh, but what is actually the action plan? So when I read about JavaScript crypto, it, the arguments weren't really convincing for me, uh, at least from nowadays point of view. Uh, so I decided finally when we have like real crypto applications, real crypto libraries written in JavaScript, uh, and they are actually being used, why not taking a deeper look at the, at the code and seeing what actually happened, like were those predictions actually real? So I, like I said, I took a look at the code, I found some vulnerabilities, I tried then to identify the root causes for those vulnerabilities, uh, and finally, I think the most important part is, I tried to compare the situation to Mm, native crypto. By native crypto, I mean like the uh, classical cryptographic um, applications like uh, OpenSSL or GNU TLS, uh, written of course in like uh, statically compiled languages and, and whatnot, right? So uh, when I started looking at, at uh, those applications, I immediately found that the vulnerabilities or some weird behaviors of, uh, of those libraries or applications are being caused by two distinct uh, issues. The first one is the language issues, the, the fact that the applications are written in a JavaScript. Um, and the second group of uh, issues was because of the web platform, how it works. Uh, we used to say in like security circles that the web is broken, which is true, obviously. Uh, and those flows would still be present no matter if the applications uh, would have been implemented in JavaScript or say, for example, uh, VB script or Visual Basic script, right? Uh, so those are more um, because of how the web works, not which language was the feature implemented it. Le let's look at the language issues. Uh, but first, do you think that language issue matter to crypto? Like, I mean, all languages are probably that. Uh, by, uh, all languages that are being used as a programming language are Turing complete. So, basically, it shouldn't really matter in in which language do you actually uh, implement the features in. But I would say that uh, they do matter. And if you think they don't. At one point, you're going to fail, and let me repeat that you are going to fail. Uh, so this is obviously an example of a go-to-fail uh, failure, uh, which was sort of uh, because of how uh, the language is implemented and that it featured like the uh, uh, go-to instructions. So let's take a look at what JavaScript actually is, uh, because it's a very tricky language. It's a dynamic one. Uh, it's a language which is weakly type. It has really weird uh, inheritance model. Uh, it has an Im implicit global object. It has a forgiving parser as well. And it's a very flexible language. You can code arbitrary JavaScript using just six characters, right? Sort of like brainfuck, for example. Uh, and obviously, if you take a deeper look at this code, you can immediately see that it's alert one, right? But <laughs> Does it matter to crypto? It's just a thing, right? Uh, so let's take a look at something. Let's take a look deeper, right? Let's take a look at weak typing of, of JavaScript. Uh, so if you try to parse an integer from, uh, from a string, uh, the result, it's not really uh, it's not really bright at the screen, but uh, if you try to parse int of, of this particular string, you get a none. But then again, if you try to parse it using hexadecimal uh, radix, you get 15, right? Totally expected. Uh, if you take, for example, math.min, it's the minimum number uh, uh, being able to be expressed by JavaScript language, uh, it's infinity. But if you take the maximum number, it's minus infinity. So if you can see immediately, like minimum number in JavaScript is actually greater than the maximum number expressed in JavaScript. Uh, and for example, null is an object, but it's not an instance of an object. So yeah, there's some things. 
So as you can see, JavaScript, because of its weekly uh, type system, can introduce some subtle flaws to any sort of program. And of course, for crypto, this uh, can be disastrous. Uh, but of course, there are things you can overcome. In this case, we have, for example, have like triple equals operators, which is, which is called identity operator. So this one uh, compares objects, uh, not, lo not, not only um, taking care of their values, but also their types. So the types should match. It's sort of safe equal operator, right? So if you assign a value to a, to a variable called A, and then you uh, plus uh, or add one to that, um, that um, variable, this shouldn't never happen, right? Like, unless you overload the operator in C++, but there's no operator overloading JavaScript, at least uh, not in a general case. Uh, so what kind of object is actually A? You might think that maybe it's not a number, that's a thing in JavaScript, there's an object called not a number or an entity called not a number, but that's not the case. Not a number is not equal to anything, even itself. Like, that's a special object. Uh, actually, infinity, yeah. If you assign infinity to A and then you add one to it, it's still infinity and it's uh, the same type. So that's expected. But then you start digging and you see that minus infinity has the same property. And for example, one times 10 to the power of 16 has also this behavior, which is kind of strange, but maybe expected. It's just a huge number. So probably something is confused, but then you start digging deeper. And actually, this is the smallest number that has this property. Why this one? No idea. It's JavaScript. And you can see immediately that there are some weird features in the language that might make implementing crypto code tricky. So crypto is based on bits, right? It's a lot of, um, a lot of operations are actually like XORing, shifting bits and whatnot. So let's take a look at, at how JavaScript implements bit shifting. So if you uh, have an, all numbers are actually floats in JavaScript, that's an implementation issue. Uh, so if you have number one, and you, then you try to left shift it by 31 bits, you get a huge negative number, which is sort of expected. But then you shift it left 32 bits, and then you get one. So you shift it 33 bits, you get two. You sort of like overflowed the whole thing. But then you start shifting it left 31 bits, and then left another one, which should be something like this, should be one, but it's actually zero because of the precedence of the operators. Uh, so you try then shifting it left 31 bits and then right 31 bits and you get minus one. And we actually have, you know, in JavaScript, we have triple uh, right shift operator, which is unsigned uh, right shift. So if you shift left 31 bits and you shift right unsigned 31 bits, you get one back again. So, yeah, tricky. Um, okay, magic property. This is, uh, this is something that was actually a vulnerability, what caused the vulnerability. So, there's a crypto card. It's a multi-party chat application. Uh, in order to exchange messages with someone, you need to uh, Get their, uh, get their pr uh, public key and then derive some shared secret with them uh, in order to symmetrically um, encrypt the uh, communication. So, uh, CryptoCut, whenever somebody new joined a uh, chat room, uh, it executed this kind of code. So, what does this, this code uh, do? It checks whether uh, there's an array called public keys. Well, it's not an array, it's an object, but it doesn't really matter. So, there's a storage for... Um, public keys. And based on the sender ID, it checks whether I already have a public key for the sender. If I do, that means I probably have a shared secret anyway, and I already talked to this person, so there's no uh, sort of key exchange to be done. Uh, so if there is no key for, for a particular sender, 
then I will just uh, store it, whatever he sent me over the wire, and then I will generate a shared secret for this sender. So this is the key ex sort of key exchange uh, part. But then, when somebody sends an encrypted message to me, I need to decrypt it. So I'm looking for a shared secret of the same sender. And if it's present, if it exists, I will just uh, authenticate the message, I will check the HMAC, and then uh, decrypt uh, the, the, using the actual um, encryption key. Looks sane in sort of any language, mostly. Uh, but it's JavaScript. And we have magic properties. And there's a magic property called underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore. And this particular property is always present in an object. Um, so you have an object, uh, an exemplary object of, let's imagine, two uh, public keys for two senders, one called one and one called, uh, and another one called two. And those are, of course, arbitrary values. But then again, uh, there's a invis sort of invisible pro property called proto. And it's always there. And if you try to evaluate this as a Boolean value, it's, it evaluates true. Because in JavaScript, an empty object, which is the value of the proto, because the proto is the instance of the uh, prototype of the object, which is an empty object in this case, uh, evaluates to true. So let's see what happens when, when a user called underscore underscore proto uh, joins the chat. So first, we are checking whether there is a public key for this um, uh, sender, for, for this um, user. This one is public keys proto, which evaluates to true, so I never generate a shared secret with them. But then again, if that user again sends something encrypted to me, I'm checking whether I have a shared secret for user proto. Of course I do, because it evaluates the true. Uh, but then I start inspecting on that object here. And this one is actually triggering, triggering an error, because the empty object does not have an HMAC property, nor does it have an MSG property. So uh, what happened is that user underscore underscore proto broke the chat for everyone else. It just stopped working. It was a sort of denial of service vulnerability in uh, CryptoCAD because of implementing that in JavaScript. But that's not really unique to JavaScript. Magic properties are present in various uh, languages. Uh, for example, in Python. Python has a lot of uh, magic properties um, on various uh, objects. And for example, uh, I demonstrated how to um, kill an application, basically, by uh, deleting an attribute by using the uh, magic property for Python application used on apt engine. So this is not something you need to JavaScript, actually. <clears throat> but then again, we have something called silent errors. So what happens in JavaScript if you try to access an index of an array outside of a bounds? You silently get uh, undefined in return, which is way better than C, for example, when you just get you know whatever was there. Uh, can it be a vulnerability? Let's see in a moment. JavaScript also natively supports Unicode strings. So there's a very often used uh, function called string.carcodeAd and then index value, which is used to sort of like an ORD function in, in, in multiple languages. You get an integer value out of a value of the characters stored at a certain offset in a string. The problem is, this is not something like in traditional, let's say, languages or languages without Unicode support, where uh, the value would be from 0 to, to, find, to 255. It's actually uh, a value which can be much greater if the original string was Unicode. And those two. Uh, features, let's say, of the JavaScript, actually led to a very beautiful attack, uh, which I dubbed 16, 16 Snowman attack. It was an attack uh, discovered by Daniel Bleichenbacher in the, one of the JavaScript uh, AES encryption libraries. It's pretty 
tricky to explain it, but I will try to do so. So let's first look at how does um, AES cipher works. It's a block cipher, so it only operates on basically 16 bytes of the data uh, at a time. Uh, and it's a multiple round cipher, so it performs similar operations um, a few times, a number of times. So uh, usually you get the plain text, which is 16 bytes. Then you, uh, well, you derive a, a key for, for, for the, for the uh, round of operations, which is uh, also 16 bytes long in the end. Then you perform a few operations uh, in a loop, each time having a, a different round key uh, applied. And then you perform some final, final round, just misses one of the operations. And then you get the ciphertext. Of course, uh, similar, happen, similar things in reverse happens when you decrypt um, the mm, ciphertext. One of the important steps in the AES encryption and decryption process uh, in uh, this particular attack is the sub-byte fun function. Uh, essentially, it's a very simple function. So you have 16 bytes, and you look at them one byte at a time. So let's imagine that the first byte is uh, 19, first byte of the um, plain text block. Uh, you have a constant values of 256 values, and you just look for an offset which is 1 and 9 in here. And at the, uh, and this particular offset, the, um, this is called the uh, S box, um, S box table. Uh, at this particular value, there's a D4. So you replace the first byte with D4, and you repeat that 16 times. Um, so let's see um, at the implementation of um, this particular library. It's very straightforward. Uh, the function is called subbytes. It accepts uh, a state, which is 16 bytes, and an S box, which is an array of those 256 values. Uh, it's, it's a constant for the whole algorithm. It doesn't depend on the key. Uh, and if you actually try to encrypt, instead of uh, 16 characters long string using ASCII characters, one of the characters is a Unicode value, <clears throat> in the state, you will actually get uh, values or elements of the state array will be more than 256. So when it tries to find the value in the S-box table, uh, it will actually silently return undefined for every byte which was Unicode. And what happens now is after the, after the uh, function, you will get the state of the cipher, which is 16 undefined values. So you immediately sort of broke one element of the first round of the cipher. But that's not all what, uh, what that happens here. So then you have another step uh, used in the AES rounds. It's called a mixed columns step. And then again, you get those poison 16 undefined values passed as, as an input. But the mixed column steps actually does a lot of XOR operations. Uh, and in JavaScript, if you undefined XOR, undefined uh, XOR 0, XOR 0, you get zero in return, because why not? And what, what's the effect of this? After uh, just almost at the end of the first round of the AS cipher, no matter what you, you were trying to encrypt as a plain text, if, you supplied, if the attacker supplied the uh, Unicode values, 16 bytes of Unicode, or 16 uh, elements of Unicode values, 16 characters, uh, you destroyed the whole state to 16 zero bytes. Then it repeats a few times, and you get some ciphertext. But then again, there comes uh, the decryption round. And the decryption round does the same operations in reverse. So in the last round of the decryption routine, you get those uh, 16 zero bytes uh, as the output. And then you just need to have the inverse subbytes, which is the same function, just being passed um, a different uh, constant table. Also, um, this constant table is like constant for the whole algorithm. 
And then you just need uh, a add round key uh, step, the final one. So this subbyte function for the last round of decryption uh, gets 16 zero bytes. So obviously, for every of those bytes, he only returns the first value of the inverse S-box table, which is known because it's, it's a public. It's, it's known for an algorithm. It's actually 52 uh, hexadecimal. And after that, there's an add round key step, which for this particular um, instance means that uh, it actually XORs uh, the, the 16 bytes with, uh, with the AES key used for uh, encryption and decryption. So what actually happened, or what attack is possible, is that having an access to this um, encryption and decryption routine without knowing the key, you can encrypt 16 bytes of Unicode, then get the result and try to decrypt the, the same result with the same unknown key, and in the end, you would get uh, the actual AES key Exodes with 16 uh, zero, zero x 52 bytes. So this immediately gives you access to the um, secret key used for this description, uh, for this um, encryption. So yeah, that I could not even call it encryption in this particular case, right? So uh, two subtle issues resulting in a pretty destroying attack, like having access to the encryption and decryption oracle uh, reveals the key, which is really bad in crypto. But is it unique to JavaScript? Or um, uh, are those language issues uh, unique to JavaScript? Well, not necessarily. So in 2014, so not that long time ago, we had a famous uh, GNU TLS, so again, written in C, um, uh, vulnerability, which was basically a certificate validation bypass. What happened? So uh, when... Uh, when the attacker connected uh, to the server, or uh, when the attacker was most, uh, to prevent many in the middle attacks on uh, TLS uh, protocol, uh, you usually need to validate the certificate of the server. And usually you check, you perform various validations, um, the CA val validation, whether the, the, the certificate was issued by a trusted uh, authority, is one of the checks. So there was this function called check if CA and it was supposed to return as documented true or false if the issuer, issuer is a CA or not. So obviously, if, if it's false, then it's a fake certificate because the issuer should be a certificate authority. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it does not return true or false. It returns int. It's right there, like two lines uh, later in the code. Uh, but C language has no exceptions. So. Uh, usually, the error values are just uh, negative numbers, right? Uh, that's how you report uh, to the calling function that there was some error condition. And actually, this function, whether uh, uh, if the uh, validation, certificate validation was invalid, it just returned minus one. It's pretty easy to trigger an error condition when you control all the input to the function. You just uh, submit the certificate which, say, uh, has um, an invalid hash value, right? Uh, so, this function to the caller would return minus one, and it was only compared to, or the caller assumed that it would only, it would return, if it returned zero value, then it would abort the whole uh, verification. So, any value other than zero would mean that the um, issuer is a CA, so perform for, for a validation and eventually accept the connection. So this subtle issue, like not having access to the uh, exceptions or a separate error object, uh, uh, caused a really serious vulnerability in the uh, library which is not apparently written in JavaScript. It's used by uh, a lot of projects, and it was assumed trusted. To sum up the language issues, I agree, JavaScript is a really tricky language, but the issues that you may encounter uh, while uh, like, um, using those weird features are not really unique to JavaScript. And you can actually, it's a good message, you can overcome all those issues. Uh, right now, there's several um, attempts of enforcing 
the strictness of the language, like ECMAScript 5 strict mode, for example. There's also type enforcing, not in the language itself, but in the compilers for those languages. For right, right now, there's quite a few languages which compile to JavaScript. There's also a closure compiler which sort of enforce for you declaration of the properties and uh, you know gives you all the Java-ish goodness uh, to uh, projects written in JavaScript. And also the usual boring stuff which actually prevents most of the vulnerabilities. So uh, all the development practices like uh, unit tests, continuous integration, code reviews, um, all the boring stuff. Um, let's move to web platform issues. So. Crypto code is not just implemented in JavaScript. It runs somewhere. So where, where does it run? So JavaScript usually is running a JavaScript engine like V8, Spider Monkey, or whatever, Iron Monkey. There were a few uh, versions of that. There's a few others. Um, this JavaScript code runs in an execution environment, like for example, in the browser, in the browser renderer process, or somewhere in a server when we have like Node.js project, right? Uh, to this code, there's different APIs available. For example, if you run JavaScript in a browser, you have the DOM. If you uh, run uh, the JavaScript in the modern browser, you have Web Crypto API. If you run it in an extension, you have the browser extension and API, and, what, and so on and so on. Also, there are multiple restrictions being placed upon the um, JavaScript code right now. For example, in the browser, you have same origin policy. Uh, you can also place a content security policy. You can place the code in the iframe sandbox. Uh, there's some extension security policy and whatnot. And all those conditions affect how, what, what is the code allowed to do and how is it actually executed. And those conditions do matter to crypto. One really uh, obvious example is XSS. So web is full of XSS and it will probably be full of XSS for the next few years at least. Uh, you can think of XSS obviously as uh, an equivalent of remote code execution uh, in this particular context if you implement at least the, the crypto libraries. Uh, of course, XSS can bypass any sort of guarantees to cryptographic code. You can replace a random number generator, you can exfiltrate the, the key, you can replace the public key to, for the attacker to, to actually encrypt the message to you, not to the um, intended recipient. And there are XSSs, even in the crypto code, not only uh, in the applications that include the crypto code, but in the applications that are the crypto code. So when we, take a look, when we took a look at uh, Mailvelope, for example, uh, this application used for in, uh, implementing OpenPGP in Gmail interface as a browser extension. So usually when you test those, those kind of applications, there's an obvious vector. So, well, because it's a public crypto, uh, OpenPGP, uh, you know how to encrypt the message to a victim because you have his public key, uh, but only he knows how to decrypt it, right? So you submit an XSS payload uh, in the mail body, encrypted to the public key of the victim, and in the hope that the victim will decrypt the message and insert it in line using DOM XSS sync, um, and you just look for the, for the result. And obviously, the result of most of the code that we have taken a look uh, in, the, in its early stages just popped up in an alert. So, obviously, you cannot trust uh, this code to actually uh, protect your, uh, for example, key material. Uh, CryptoCAD had the same vulnerability. Like, in this case, uh, the vulnerability or the, um, the actual source of um, the DOM XSS flow was in the username, so the most obvious scenario. You submit, uh, there was a client-side validation, so you could modify the client code of your CryptoCAD I change your username to a DOM XSS payload, and then join a chat, uh, basically pwning everyone else. But this was really uh, disastrous in this case, because CryptoCAD at the time, it was a browser extension. So <clears throat> any sort of code that executed, executed in, with those elevated privileges. Uh, in case of Chrome, 
the extensions were protected by content security policy. So there was not much that could be done. The JavaScript execution would be prevented. You could only sort of spoof a uh, user interface. But for, for Firefox, uh, it's sort of the end of the game. If you have an XSS in a Firefox, Firefox add-on, you pretty much, pretty much can install malware. Uh, you have direct access to the file system and whatnot. So, obviously, XSS is a problem for JavaScript crypto. But, again, is this something so super unique? Not really. Again, vulnerability from this year. Uh, there's a GNU TLS, obviously a TLS implementation, like sort of a competition for OpenSSL, used pretty widely, I think, in Debian. So there was a buffer overflow uh, in the uh, passing of the uh, long session or session ID for, for the client. So obviously buffer overflow uh, causing a memory corruption and potentially executing, uh, allowing the attacker to execute arbitrary code. It's the same thing. XSS in the, uh, say, Firefox add-on is has the same consequences, basically, as uh, executing uh, arbitrary code, at least to the crypto code. Um, let's look at another thing. One of the often spotted vulnerabilities in JavaScript crypto, crypto code results from poor randomness. So a lot of uh, applications, libraries, use the uh, age-old math.random function, which is supposed to return so the random numbers. Unfortunately, uh, those are being generated by, by a random number generator which is not cryptographically safe. Uh, specifically, you can recover the state of the uh, PRNG and therefore derive the future uh, random numbers being generated by it, uh, even cross-domain. There was some uh, research by Ivan uh, on that uh, subject. Instead, Modern JavaScript engines uh, have access to a cryptographically safe uh, P uh, PRNG, which is uh, usually accessed using crypto get random values function or in the case of Node.js crypto.random bytes. But we have access to a say, strong random number generator, but it's very often. It's very easy and it's often the case that the library authors or the software authors just relied on math random. For example, CryptoCAD again. Uh, CryptoCAD uses this protocol. Uh, whatever that is, I won't go into the details, but if you look at the specification of the protocols, it says that the SID and RID uh, numbers are security critical and therefore must be both unpredictable and non-repeating. Math random gives you no of such guarantees. And obviously what CryptoCAD did, or actually the Bosch library that uh, CryptoCAD uh, included, was just use the math random function. Uh, CryptoCAD had another fun thing with randomness. Uh, this was actually even publicized as the, the, the CryptoCAD uh, exploit or vulnerability. Uh, so CryptoCAD wanted to generate uh, key. In order to generate a key, you usually want to have like high entropy, a lot of, uh, a lot of entropy to uh, pro prevent uh, from brute forcing attacks. So uh, it used the uh, function called cryptocut.randomString, which is, as you can see in the comment, 64 random bytes. 64 random bytes, it's huge entropy. Uh, but if you take a look at the implementation of this function, it actually, uh, based on those parameters, which is a great idea, uh, anyway, ba based on those parameters, it returned 64 characters. Uh, in this particular case, uh, numeric characters, so 0 to 9. As you can see, you, you have something like uh, 3 bits of entropy per character. Uh, multiplied by uh, 64 is way less than expected for uh, 500 um, bytes of entropy. So this and other flaws resulting from uh, the developer not really or not really having access to a good random or a good secret generation mechanism uh, allowed to uh, effectively brute force. Um, um, 
a random a, a random string used to used to um, um, form a key. Again, this is not something so super unique to JavaScript. This was uh, a few years ago. Uh, it was called the Debian OpenSSL fiasco. So uh, Debian package of the OpenSSL uh, library, uh, OpenSSL needs to generate a lot of uh, random numbers, as you can imagine. Adds, it uses various entropy sources to, uh, to like initialize the, the, the whole thing. And one of the sources was uninitialized memory uh, addresses. So super cool. But unfortunately, uh, Debian maintainer used Valgrind, which is like a, a tool to analyze uh, uh, for memory corruption issues. And it found that it triggered a lot of warnings, like you're trying to access the memory which, you, uh, which is uninitialized. Uh, it's probably uh, something tricky. So the Debian maintainer asked the uh, mailing list about can I just remove the lines of code or comment out the lines of code which feed the entropy source from the, uh, any, from the uh, unmapped memory? And they said, yeah, I, I don't see a point, why not? So he did, and actually the only entropy source for the uh, random number generator was the process ID, which is like 32, byte, uh, 32 bits. So in general, for uh, two years, if anyone generated SSH keys on those Debian system, it could only generate to uh, 32K possible keys. So again, trying to deal with random numbers is tricky no matter the language or no matter the platform. Um, timing side channels. Uh, so the thing is, in crypto operations, at least some of the operations uh, should execute in a constant time in order to the attacker not derive some information from the timing. And unfortunately for JavaScript, at least in the browser, the timing differences are really measurable because the attacker is not on a separate machine. He's usually in a second tab in a browser, for example, which means he executes the code on the same CPU, uh, sometimes even in the same thread. So he's really close and his measurements can be really precise um, and by that, the attacks are actually made practical because there's a lot of remote timing attacks which are not practical because the uh, amount of noise and the precision of the uh, amount of noise is, is pretty big and the precision is too low for the, for the attacker to distinguish the actual uh, differences. Unfortunately, in JavaScript, we don't have that uh, um, lucky situation. Uh, it is possible, and it was demonstrated already uh, this year, it is possible in some conditions to brute force an 18th digit, digit number in other frame, cross domain, uh, in about three minutes by simply measuring the time it takes to, to compute certain operations. So, are the JavaScript applications trying to protect against timing search channels? Sometimes, sometimes not. This is a classic example, again, uh, from OpenPGPJS library. Uh, this is a sort of function which tries to decode the padding used for RSA um, encryption. Uh, and uh, the thing with RSA is decoding a padding or validating that a padding is correct should be done in a constant time, because otherwise uh, it gives uh, attacker the access to the oracle, which is pretty powerful, and can, uh, uh, using this oracle, the attacker can actually derive the plain text by just sending repeat repeatable, a little slightly modified code. Uh, unfortunately, in this particular function, uh, there's branching. There's an if um, here. There's an if here. There's an uh, Here's there's an OR operation, so because of how most of the uh, languages work, there would be an, um, how do you call it, like early exit from the, from, the, um, uh, from the condition situation. There's an early exit here, explicit, by using return minus one, and the, finally here there's the usual, uh, uh, usual exit from the function. This function is, has way more uh, timing side channels that should be uh, allowed. Um, and 
as the effect of this, this function is prone. And uh, uh, RSA encryption used by OpenPGP um, JS library was uh, vulnerable to Bleichenbacher attack, allowing to, uh, for the attacker to decrypt the plain text. Again, this is not something unique to JavaScript or uh, web platform. The exact same thing was found this year. Was it this year? Yeah, this year. It's, it's this thing. Uh, was found this year in uh, Java Secure Sockets um, uh, extensions, uh, which is also RSA just used in, in a TLS, not uh, OpenPGP protocol. Um, and I can tell you that writing constant time code is really tricky, no matter the language, no matter the platform, because the compiler optimizes things a lot. So if you are trying to write a library or any sort of algorithm in a language, the compiler, uh, and, and you really tried not to make an early exit uh, to uh, avoid branching, the compiler, while compiling the code and optimizing the code, really wants the code to execute quickly. So uh, it optimizes some of your countermeasures, and it's really tricky, actually, to, to create, a for the crypto applications, uh, constant time code. So uh, it's not really seen very much here, but this is, for example, how a Go library, or Go crypto library, uh, implements a function which compares one byte to another byte in constant time. It's not just an equal thing. It, uh, it exos the byte values. Here it's, uh, it's an end equals uh, z right shifted four bytes, then end equals right shifted two, byte, two, two bits, and one bit again, and returns whether the uh, resulting element is, is zero or not. This is to prevent optimi optimizations by the compiler and by the processors as well. So sometimes if you need to have a constant code, you need to e even look at the implementation of the uh, microprocessor code and see that there are some differences that might trick you. Uh, so comp uh, compiler optim optimizations, whether it's being done by JavaScript uh, engine or any other execution environment, it's something that you need to be aware of when implementing crypto code. Then there's a case of direct memory access. You all probably remember Heartbleed, right? So it wasn't a crypto vulnerability. Uh, it was just a stupid uh, uh, lack of bounce check. But uh, the results were really important to crypto. I mean, you had what you thought is an encrypted channel, right? So there's confidentiality. But actually the attacker accessed the raw memory, like before the decryption, it could extract requests, parts, uh, some even claim that the keys uh, could be extracted. Uh, and as you can probably uh, know, like implementing or having vulnerabilities, uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities is pretty common in, in uh, C, for example. So, uh, luckily, JavaScript is a memory-safe language. We don't have memory corruption issues at all. Like, there's no out-of-bounds check. No, that's go there's no buffer overflow in, in JavaScript. It's just not possible. Uh, or really, well, not really. Um, so, JavaScript, like I said, is not an abstract thing. It's run in a concrete implementation of a JS engine. Uh, for example, in, in, in V8 engine used by uh, Chrome. And Firefox has its own uh, JavaScript engine. And even this year, there was some vulnerabilities in the implementations of the language uh, engine, uh, allowing for out-of-bounds reads and writes into the JavaScript heap, allowing for arbitrary code execution. This was, this was huge. This is a very similar vulnerability was uh, disclosed uh, by GeoHot uh, in, uh, Chrome th in V8 used by Chrome 33. And if you take a look at the part of the exploit code, it's very uh, fun. You just create an array buffer over a small uh, memory uh, mm, buffer. And then you define getter, because in JavaScript you have getters and setters. So you can redefine them. And you overwrote the byte length property of this array buffer to return a huge number. So 
then you initialize an array pointing to the same buffer. Uh, and while it allocated only a small amount of memory, uh, when the inner code, like the implementation of the V8 language, uh, checked to see how much am I allowed to view a memory, how, how, how big of the chunk of the memory am I allowed to read, it returned this value. So you could write and read arbitrary memory addresses. And you can imagine what, uh, what followed. So yes, JavaScript is a memory safe language. No, JavaScript engine is not. It's written not in JavaScript. Well, there are some cases when JavaScript is run by JavaScript, but inception. So uh, when you implement JavaScript crypto code and you really want to be secure, you need to be aware that the browsers themselves, because that's the most common uh, execution environment for JS, uh, browsers themselves are also part of your attack surface. So you need to uh, make sure that the network stack used by the browsers is uh, secure. The HTML parser is secure. Good luck with that. And the JavaScript engine as well is secure. And the problem is that any URL that your user visits can actually uh, trigger some kind of vulnerability in those huge code bases. Is it unique? to JavaScript or to web platform? Not really. So it's sort of like a malware problem. So you cannot implement a cryptographic uh, securely. You cannot uh, trust uh, in cryptographic programs uh, run on a machine which has, which has malware installed. It's sort of like, by definition, it's a game over, right? So. Uh, if your kernel has vulnerabilities and the attacker has exploited the kernel, it can pretty much do anything with your crypto code. It can, just a stupid example, right? I can just, any process can just read your private key from, from SSH. Uh, and yeah, even in GNUPG FAQ, they said that yes, our code is secure, but actually there was a case when uh, there was some drug enforcement uh, investigation and they just install a keylogger and yeah, they got access to the, private, to the raw private key and were able to decrypt the messages. So uh, the problem is for JS Crypto, you need to understand that the uh, browser uh, becomes uh, the equivalent of your operating system when uh, you're thinking about uh, native crypto. Unfortunately, there's one really important difference here. So uh, the problem is, that in usual operating systems, you usually decide what to install. You uh, download the software package, uh, unpack it, sometimes compile it. Uh, there's some sort of like integrity, integrity checking along the way. There's package managers and all those other features that you rely on to not run untrusted code on your machine. That's not the case for the browsers. You visit, you, you visit a URL and it's, it's just a giant drive-by downloads uh, playground, right? Uh, immediately, if you think that your browser is your OS, it's the equivalent of curling an arbitrary <coughs> website or binary blob, then extracting it, configuring it, compiling it, and then running it. That's what you do. Like we all visit like hundreds of, of resources daily, thousands, I would even say. And each of those can exploit a vulnerability in your browser or all the other, uh, like PDF uh, reader and whatnot. And all of those would be disastrous to your crypto code. Uh, so the only thing that the browser does when allowing this untrusted code to execute is they provide you same origin policy. Like, that's a really thin layer of isolating your code. And unfortunately, roughly half of the users worldwide use the browser uh, that implements any kind of sandbox. Uh, I mean, sandbox from the, in the OS level, like process level sandbox or something. Uh, so the situation is somewhat difficult or tricky for JavaScript run in the browser to uh, to trust in this code. So is JS Crypto doomed? I mean, you can create a perfect, uh, XSS-free, super protected, 
audited by hundreds of people code, uh, which is constant time and you can rely on it. You, know, you trust that the server that serves the code is uh, never become is never compromised is being maintained by the, the best security people in the world uh, of course the co the code is served from https website and no you use the certificate authority you use certificate pinning there's no way of man in, man in the middling the, the thing uh, but still your user just in a separate tab visits uh, a page uh, from some random adult movie site and gets triggered, gets pawned by an exploit and yeah, the attacker can basically bypass anything. So, can we fix this? Well, we can only go so far in JavaScript, uh, we can only go so far as providing the extensions. So, uh, what's a browser extension? So, it's not a plugin, it's not like a uh, PDF reader or uh, Flash or Java, for this matter. Fortunately, there's not much Java in the browsers now. Uh, so it's still a JavaScript application using HTML for UI rendering and CSS, uh, but it's running in sort of like a separate environment in a privileged zone, the Chrome zone usually. It's, it's called Chrome. Uh, and you need to install it. Uh, so uh, the browser is sort of isolated by some more guarantees than this, just the same origin policy. Uh, for example, in Chrome, the browser extension runs in a separate browser process. So in order for the attacker to execute the arbitrary code, uh, is he has to have two vulnerabilities. The first one, which is uh, pawning the browser renderer process, and then something which is called the sandbox bypass. Uh, of course, there are exploit chains which trigger those two, vulnerability, two vulnerabilities, but they are much rarer than just a single one, as you can imagine. So, by packaging your application in a browser extension, you, one, get much more isolation from uh, other websites that the user is visiting, so you're not protected only by same origin policy. Uh, you sometimes get the OS level protections. There's a much smaller attack surface because by definition, the websites cannot arbitrarily interact with the extension. Whereas in the web case, any, t any browser tab can like send XHR, XML HTTP requests to your website, to your server and uh, alter its behavior somehow. Um, so, this is something that we can implement the, the JavaScript crypto code in. Unfortunately, it's not super perfect. I mean, it is still possible to trigger XSS vulnerabilities in the extensions. Uh, it's very tricky in Chrome right now because of the arbitrary content security policy, but uh, in Firefox, it's sort of like it's 2008 still. Uh, also, the process isolations that I talked to, to you about a few minutes ago, well, it's sort of not yet there. I mean, if you run a huge amount of processes, uh, there's a limit that kicks in, and you uh, eventually the Chrome extension will share the process with another Chrome extension. Uh, and there are always side channels uh, to um, exploit. So the only recommendations I can give for implementing crypto code in JavaScript is use some sort of isolated environment. Never implement JavaScript crypto just in a website. Uh, so usually it's some sort of server side like Node.js uh, environment or browser extensions. Use standard development practices, uh, code review, JS compilers, uh, make sure you never uh, are affected by those weird features of the language. Use CSP to mitigate um, XSS vulnerabilities. Mm, of course, you can use constant time, timing operations. Good luck with that. It's very tricky. Uh, and yeah, you can use request throttling to mitigate side channel exploitation because m most of the time, exploiting t timing side channels requires the attacker to send like huge amount of requests. So you can throttle that. <laughs> Summary: JS crypto is way better than it used to be. Uh, despite the examples that I've just shown. Uh, if you want to 
understand JS crypto, you always need to compare it to the native crypto as well. Because there are similar problems, they are just being named differently. Uh, and if I were to compare, the platform issues are much harder to solve. The, the, the issues with the web platform and the code execution playground that it provides is much harder to solve than just tricks with bit shifting, for example. And the malware will always win. So host security is always the security one-on-one -on -one in, this, in that case. And by that, I would like to finish. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Well, unfortunately, we don't have time enough anymore for, for questions. Uh, so please, a round of applause.